I'm Francis Levy. Ed Nusessian and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center, and welcome to Mathematics and Beauty, a greatly awaited second roundtable in our series on mathematics and imagination. Uh, before we go on, I wanted to call your attention to the exhibit on the wall. A lot of people walk into Philotetes and they think that the art is decorative, not, and they, don't, uh, they look at it as wall covering. It is not. All the shows that we do, which are curated by Hallie Cohn in tandem with Adam Ludwig on our staff, are related to roundtables. And this is on aesthetics and mathematics. And the, the, the head you may have seen on the way in is by Sarah Ferguson. She was a mathematician. Is she here? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to say something about it? Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and th those are real equations, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's why I didn't understand them. <laughs> uh, I only understand imaginary numbers. Now, it's due to, due to Barry. Um, Harish Levani's have to do with algorithms. Devon Powers, you'll see if you look around, are about symmetry. And Joan Waltermath uh, is interested in Fibonacci type sequences. Uh, the exhibit ro obviously runs in tandem with these two roundtables. We had a wonderful lecture by Lauren Graham on infi naming infinity, and we also had a previous lecture on Euler. So all this has been sort of a couple of months uh, in which we've immersed ourselves in, in mathematics. We're very excited. We've been, you know, I've been, I've been talking to you candidly about our condition, which has been is and precarious and has been precarious. But we've gotten a lot of vindication. Uh, by virtue of the grants we've been getting. Um, the New York State Council on the Arts is awarding us grants in poetry and music. We've been in, in very serious talks with the National Endowment of the Humanities and Arts, uh, and they, it looks like we're going to be getting some funding in, the, in those areas, one of those areas at least. And we, you know, we have received the Bloomberg Grant, Department of Cultural Affairs, and, and most recently the Elsie Wunsch Foundation. We want to thank very much the Elsie Wunsch Trust for the gift they gave us. But the, what, what, what's the interesting part about these grants that we've applied for uh, is that they are not a lot of money, really. Uh, they are a kind of, for us, credibilization. I, that's not the right word, but it is a kind of credibilization, vindication, or an award for all the work that our staff and we have put into thinking out these panels, of which we're very proud, and our other research activities. But we do need, we need a patron, and we need support. So think about Philoctetes. There's a PayPal on our site. And uh, now I'm very happy to introduce one of our great Philoctetes supporters, Barry Mazur. Uh, Barry Mazur is Gerhard, how do you, pr how do you pronounce that? Gada. Gerhard Gada, university professor at Harvard, where he teaches in the mathematics department. He is the author of imaginary, imagining numbers, particularly the square root of minus 15. No, I, I'm, I'm working on minus 1. <laughs> and his research interests include number theory, automorphic forms, and related issues in algebraic geometry. He is the winner of the Veblen Prize, the Cole Prize, and the Steele Prize from the American Mathematical Society, and has been elected a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Barry Mazur will moderate this afternoon's roundtable and introduce our other distinguished guests. Take it away, Barry. Uh, thanks uh, loads, Francis. Um, I am really honored to be in the panel with uh, our other guests. Uh, starting on my left is Eva Brandt. She's uh, taught in uh, St. John's College for over half a century and has written uh, a number of wonderful books, including The World of the Imagination, Sum and Substance. Um, her uh, uh, interests are enormously broad. And um, every time I ask a question about beauty, I ask it first of her and then of Elaine, who is uh, a professor of English at um, uh, uh, Harvard University. She's a colleague, uh, colleague of mine. Uh, in fact, uh, you're William M. Cabot Professor of Aesthetics and the General Va Theory of Value at Harvard and has written some magnificent books, including uh, Dreaming by the Book and On Beauty and Being Just. Uh, to my left is uh, Brian Green, who I think must be known to everyone in the room for his uh, uh, wonderful uh, expository work on uh, bringing string theory to, uh, uh, to comprehension to people who are um, uh, uh, interested, but not necessarily 
uh, uh, technically um, in the field. Now, that's a very difficult thing to do. And the elegant universe and the fra fabric of the cosmos is a, sort of a great uh, contribution to our literature, as is um, the work of um, uh, Mario Levy, whose book, The Golden Ratio, uh, is uh, uh, absolutely wonderful uh, contribution as well. Mario Levy is a uh, uh, senior astrophysicist and head of the Office of Public Outreach at the Space Telescope Center Institute. Brian Green is uh, co-director of uh, Columbia University's Institute for String Cosmo Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics. I think I was the designated moderator, and that means um, <clears throat> uh, I uh, was uh, meant to introduce the people of the roundtable to you. I also introduced the roundtable to you as uh, uh, the first example of an element of beauty in mathematics. And I, <laughs> Eva, what do you think about that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was uh, uh, thinking about what uh, uh, might have been meant by saying that Euclid alone looked on beauty bare, which is probably the funniest line in poetry ever written. What is it again? I didn't get that. Euclid alone has looked on beauty bare. It's Edna St. Vincent Millay, and if you think of it properly, you have to laugh. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, uh, I wondered what an example might be of uh, of bare beauty. Uh, that doesn't mean beauty nude. It means beauty in some pure way. And uh, certainly the ancient tradition is that circles are the most beautiful objects in the world. So I began to think about what makes them beautiful. Uh, I'll only give the last one of my conclusions that one of the beauties of a circle is that if you sit around it, everybody's equal. And uh, King Arthur's round table was established for that purpose, so that all the Knights should be the same. Uh, so in, uh, that is one of the beauties of a circle. It, every place on it is, as is often said in the literature, beginning and end at once. Also, it has a determinable center, just one. And there are dozens and dozens of other good characteristics that it has. But I want to finish this speech by saying that when I put all those things together, I didn't know what about, about it exactly was beautiful. It seems interesting, but is interesting the same as beautiful? So I end with a question. Uh, uh, this will be my last moderational uh, <laughs> chore. Um, Eva ended with a question. And uh, the minute people have questions, I hope it's OK, uh, Ed and Francis, if the minute anyone has a question, jump in. Well, um, Barry, one, one thing ah, we tried to do, it's not okay. We tried to yeah. let the roundtablers talk for a while yep. first, and then we give a, we have a period of, of time uh, leaving at least about what uh, half an hour, forty five. I see. Okay. So, All right. But, you know. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I think the 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 uh, the other uh, moderational duty is to sort of ask other other people to sort of. Chime in with uh, questions. I do have a question as well, but I'll, I'll leave that for later. It seems to me, I always said it's interesting, but is it beautiful? But what is beautiful? You know, what is the definition of beautiful? That's your question. Well, I agree with um, Ava's description, and I know that not only the circle, but the sphere. Uh, was even more. beloved, yeah, even more yeah. by Parmenides and Plato and yeah. Boethius as yeah. the most perfect of, of forms because every point on it was equidistant from the center, yes. and um, and I think that when they invoke the sphere, um, they're not always explicitly thinking of the principle of equality the way we do, that is political equality, and yet. It certainly is anticipatory of it. And so even something like, say, Augustine's De Musica, where he talks about the way in which we may first come to know numbers through the bodily experience of rhythm, um, he, he, talks about, uh, he talks about equal measure and equality as the most perfect event. And he sees it in musical form, and he sees it in 
the smoothness of surfaces and even in the uniformity of the color of the sky. And certainly he sees it as an attribute of God. And again, I don't think he's talking about political equality, but I think that it is um, making audible or available principles that um, in philosophers, we then, philosophers who do care about um, equality as a principle of justice, we hear again, as in Rawls's famous definition of justice as fairness requiring a symmetry in um, all our relations with one another, or in the many centuries of talk about um, the necessity of an equal balance between, say, crimes and punishments, or work and compensation, and so forth. Um, I, I guess, you know, when I came here and I, I thought about this math and beauty, I mean, you, you mentioned the word mathematics and beauty. Um, and, and I thought that there are actually um, a few rather different things which are related to this topic. Uh, one would be of the type of uh, when do mathematicians call something beautiful? Uh, and there is a whole series of things that have to do with that, and we can maybe speak about them later. But that, that would be one thing. Then there is a second thing which relates to the question you asked, which is, uh, you know, even every person on the street has a certain sense of aesthetics uh, and, and of beauty. Uh, by the way, artists don't like so much the word beautiful, but, so, but they use other words. But, there are something that we call aesthetic and so on. And the question is, is mathematics in any way related to the concept that the ordinary person would call beautiful? And uh, just as a tiny example, I mean, the two of you just mentioned the concept of symmetry, which relates to this circle, but relates to many other things, and enters into this. Uh, to the and some people try to carry it to the ex to extremes, like uh, you know a mathematician that I'm sure you know very well, and probably you too, uh, G. D. Berkhoff, even tried to develop a mathematical theory of beauty. Uh, I don't think it's a very good theory, but you know he nevertheless tried to do that. So so that is a second type of question that relates math and beauty. Then. There is another question, you know, I'm an astrophysicist, so what I try to do is explain the universe. Um, when do we call a theory of the universe beautiful? What are the requirements for that? And there is a whole series of questions that are related to that. And finally, uh, there is something which I once dubbed uh, passive effectiveness of mathematics. Namely, there is a sense when uh, Mathematicians do something with absolutely no application whatsoever in mind, and somehow decades later, or sometimes centuries later, that very precise branch of mathematics turned out to be a very precise explanation to some natural phenomenon, and uh, they see great beauty in that. So there are all these different things, and. You know, after I let everybody speak, I, I'm happy to give examples from each one of these. But there are many relations between the world, the word beauty, and the word mathematics. Just to add maybe one thought to that. I think the idea of judging whether something is or is not going to be characterized as meeting a criterion of beauty, I think oftentimes one views that as a static type of process. You look at something and you try to assess it on some scale or another. And as you're saying, there are many different scales and many different domains. But I think there's another side of it which is more dynamic, which is, in particular, as you're saying, when you are a physicist, as we are, trying to use mathematics to actually describe something, there is a sense in the actual work. There are these rare moments when the mathematics seems to be driving you as opposed to you driving the mathematics. And there's a sense at that moment of an alignment between this abstract body of understanding and knowledge with this real world, this real universe that you're trying to use it to describe. And it's that close alignment, step by step by step, driving you forward that gives you some inner sense that you're touching something 
spectacular, something beautiful, something right. that in, is in, really... In, almost an inevitability. That's right, exactly. That, that that, I think that actually is the word that I would use too, the sense of you not making choices, the mathematics is making the choices for you, and it's a sense, as you say, of an inevitable motion forward in an effort to describe something real as opposed to something, something abstract. Since, since I have two physicists here, let me say that it goes the other way as well. I mean, very much so, and especially with uh, modern uh, uh, theoretical physics and string theory in particular, um, where the string theorists for the past 20 years have been coming to the mathematicians and telling them first that their view of the subject, the mathematicians' view of the subject, their own subject, mathematics, or a specific aspect of mathematics, is not broad enough and making incredibly precise predictions about what will happen if one expands one's viewpoint. Incredibly precise to the extent that there are uh, specific uh, enumer uh, enumerations which are of great interest to the mathematicians. Uh, and yet, uh, the mathematicians didn't feel that it was just the right, it was the right time even to ask, to pose the questions. The physicists come and say to them, uh, because of our physical intuition, we feel that there are 22 million um, uh, fifth degree genus zero curves on a cubic, on a, uh, um, on a, a three-dimensional uh, fifth-degree uh, space, and uh, the mathematicians will very often be able to prove it, but they will never have the intuition, or at least they haven't so far, uh, how they uh, achieve the intuition that seems to come naturally to the physicists that allowed the physicists to make this prediction. Well, in fact, the mathematicians actually said the prediction was wrong. The mathematicians <laughs> said the prediction was wrong, exactly. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to say that if there are any mathematicians in the audience. <laughs> but yes, uh, yes, the physicists with their intuition somehow predicted something that corrected, and it's a very large number, by the way. It was not uh, corrected uh, a, a, a small numerical error corrected something very precise, but that one thing was one of many, many, many things that had happened over the past 20 years. What is incredibly beautiful in mathematics that's hard to pin down is intuitions and sources of intuition. So if you think of it, when we talk about beauty, if you look around the room, we're seeing visual beauty. And one of our great mathematical intuitions is is being able to envision things. Uh, the physicists have other intuitions which don't have words, at least uh, uh, in my vocabulary, and yet uh, produce these sort of wonderful, let's say, uh, directives, directives for further uh, understanding. And that itself, if we have a, a, a forum for math and beauty, it seems to me that one should also celebrate the fact that part of the beauty of uh, mathematics is the fact that there is these marvelous intuitions that we, all of us, have. And we're constantly improving or sort of making more, um, uh, let's say, uh, making sharper, making more imaginative. That itself is an object of beauty. So although we should celebrate the sphere and the circle, I think we should celebrate the, uh, the increase of intuitions that comes along with the, uh, the interplay of, of uh, uh, mathematics and our thoughts, and particularly the interplay of physics and mathematics and our thoughts. Since you go in that direction, I just elaborate one point on that, because we did start with your suggestion talking about symmetry, the circle yeah. and the sphere. Mm -hmm. 
And in terms of the way a physicist's intuition may differ from what you might expect based upon these kinds of ideas and these kinds of objects, what we find in physics is that in many ways the most beautiful structures are the ones that are almost but not quite symmetric. Yeah. And that isn't something which is particularly unfamiliar. You know, we love asymmetry in a way that we love symmetry too. But in our efforts to use math to describe physical phenomenon, we found that you have to move away from the symmetric settings. We have a very specific name for it. It's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And it's a phenomenon familiar to most physicists, but it's basically a mathematical description of an almost symmetric situation. And what we find is that the universe seems to be almost symmetric in many, many ways. And it's almost symmetric this way and that way. And based upon those almost symmetries, you can make predictions about what particle you should see in a collision at an accelerator. And to me, it's the most astounding thing that uses this almost symmetric mathematical description. And it tells you there should be a particle that weighs 178 times that much of a proton, or you know, 93 times that of a proton. And you go to these accelerators, you smash particles together, and goodness gracious, there's just that kind of a particle in the debris from the collisions. That is beautiful. You know that. <laughs> Brian, that's, that's, that's an analogy. Brian, that's Ariel yeah. Leo, part of, part of yeah. what most people think of as uh, you know, beauty, beauty in con contravention to what scientists might consider or mathematicians. Mm -hmm. But what your de definition is, it sounds a little bit more like an aesthetic definition of beauty, which is playing between order and disorder, mm -hmm. or what we do in, in aesthetic concerns. Um, yeah, you know, I, I was going to say, it, it brings it, it aligns it with the way that one thinks of beauty in non-mathematical or non-physical cases, which is, one might say, flawed perfection. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but, yeah. Yes, so that, that let, me, let me nevertheless say that, I mean, uh, Brian tried to emphasize this slight breaking of symmetry. <laughs> but we wouldn't be speaking about this slight breaking of symmetry or spontaneous symmetry breakdown if there wasn't the symmetry, yeah. you know, that you That's speak right. about. Yes, so what this slight breaking of symmetry, it, it allows you to move and to develop things that are complex. For example, you know, he mentioned these particles. If there was a precise symmetry be between all the particles and antiparticles in the universe, then we wouldn't be here to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Because all these particles and antiparticles would annihilate each other, and the whole universe would just be, be filled with radiation, and we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Because of this tiny, tiny break of that symmetry, which is like one part in three billion, in the breaking of symmetry between particles and antiparticles, this is what allowed us, well, galaxies, stars, us, everything else to emerge. So there is a, an incredible symmetry that's underlying that, but then you need this tiny break. You know, it's like um, Cindy Crawford's mall, you know, here? Yes. <laughs> you, you, you know, I mean, she's perfectly symmetric, but then she has that thing which makes her a little bit more interesting. <laughs> and, that pins it down, doesn't it? Well, it does, I think it does pin it down, but it also is important to keep your <laughs> overall point in mind that without the all, the large fact of symmetry, even the asymmetry, wouldn't be interesting. Sometimes um, my students will say to me, well, isn't a face like the one you mentioned actually more beautiful because of the asymmetry? But we're talking about a face that's 99.99% you know, .99 symmetrical. And when, when you know, any of us were suddenly to have an injury, let's say if we were in Iraq or uh, had some terrible uh, you know, cancer or something of the bone, that that would not be perceived as as beautiful. And and I often think that injury is op operating as as one of the opposites to beauty. So it's I think it is t important to underscore that something that both of you have emphasized the tiny yes. break in the symmetry. Um, I think that one of the really things that's interesting about uh, what what you introduced, Brian, is that. One of the puzzles to me about math and beauty is the question of where it, it starts. That is, when you're talking about non-mathematical contexts, beauty is often at the threshold of the work that you do. So for example, the, the famous description in Plato's Phaedrus of what happens when you come into the presence 
and the example he gives is you come to the presence, Socrates comes into the presence of a beautiful boy and suddenly, you know, the, his wings are beginning to sprout and he's breaking into a cold sweat because he's remembering the immortal world where things like truth and goodness and justice reside. And this is now the beginning of a call to work on those things. So beauty is really instigating acts of education and searches for justice and throughout the whole tradition we've had versions of that of, of the description of beauty as a call um, or as a as a greeting uh, to to some new endeavor sometimes Elaine if I may carry on where yeah. you started it's in the Phaedrus yes Phaedrus most romantic dialogue, yes. right? second most romantic dialogue, that there is a one-line definition of beauty which strikes me as really right. He says beauty is visibility. Yes. That's what it means to be beautiful, to be seeable. Yeah. How does that strike people? It, it's it beautiful, might be, it might be it. the key to why there's any relationship at all between math and beauty. Yes. I, in fact, if you think of it, it's pretty strange. I mean, there is mathematics is has a, a primary mission to explain things. Now, if you have to go into the muck and deal with the ugly truth, you would do it because your mission is to explain, not to produce beauty. And yet, no matter what type of mathematics you, uh, you do, or what type of mathematics you learn, you read, you think about, uh, it's suffused in beauty. And the question is, uh, the question for me is, has always been why. I've never really understood it. I always, at one point, I, would, I thought of it as a bonus as for hard work. You prove a theorem, and you're, you know, you're, your payback is, it's beautiful. If it weren't beautiful, you'd be happy to prove it also. But uh, you, it's a bonus. Uh, but you're, you're linking it with visibility sort of makes, makes a, sort of a much firmer link in some sense between seeing things, between epistemology, if you wish, and, um, and, uh, and beauty. And maybe, maybe that's why uh, not only is uh, are the ideas of mathematics beautiful, but also everything that's in, in this room that surrounds us, which are mathematical uh, structures, if you want, beautiful as well. It's not only that it is in itself visible, but that it gets to us as visible. In other words, both aspects of visibility. The, there, is, there is certainly an element of this which has a history, which maybe I'll, I'll just tell a small story. Um, there was this Italian mathematician, uh, Gerolamo Cardano. He lived in the 16th century. And, and he wrote this famous book about mathematics, Ars Magna. And uh, he solves their equations of first degree, second degree, third degree, and actually with the help of a student, Ludovico Ferrari, also fourth degree. But in the introduction, you see, they people at the time thought of a linear equation that describes a line, and the quadratic describes an area, and the cubic describes a volume. So in his introduction, he says that he will sh show the solutions to all of those equations, and he will, in passing, discuss also higher levels, uh, which he meant the quartic with, with the fourth power. He says, but only in passing because nature does not allow such things, he said. And then there was another mathematician in the 17th century, John Wallace, from whose books Newton actually studied mathematics. And Wallace said, you know, if you run a line into a line, you get a plane. A line into a plane, you get a solid. But what happens if you run a solid into a solid? Is this a plan or plane or what? This is a monster of nature, he says. So at that time, you know, what was not really visible, if you like, to them, they regarded as a monstrosity. You know, 
After that, you know, Lagrange started a little bit and so on. Eventually, of course, Einstein, you know, and so on. Fourth dimension is, is by now children in, grad school, in, in, in elementary school already learn about, you know. And if you work in string theory, you talk about 10, 10 plus 1, maybe 26 dimensions and so on. All of these things are regarded as beautiful now because they are if you like, visible. I mean, they're not quite visible, but they are visible at least in our mind's eye. But, but is visible the, the operative word? In other words, something that I've struggled for a long time, which goes along exactly the same uh, line of thinking, but perhaps comes to a different outcome, is as our physical theories evolve to explain different data that we get, so we get data from the cosmic microwave background radiation, we get data from accelerator experiments, we find that we have to modify our theories to describe the data does our aesthetic sense evolve along with the changing theories that are driven by data so that no matter what our theory ultimately is, we'll say, oh, that's beautiful, and it's beautiful because it describes the data correctly? Or is there some innate, immutable aesthetic sense that will ultimately brought, be brought to bear? And even if the theory describes the universe, we'll say, no, that doesn't feel beautiful. That's, that's, that's not going to mean. I think, and you, I, you will tell me if you agree with me or not. I mean, I think that there are some elements that we all like there to, the, them to be there. Uh, so one is reductionism. We would like to have a theory that is as simple as possible, that describes as many things right. as possible, right? It's, it's almost like, you know, when I was in elementary school, they taught us that in Western tradition, one god is better than many gods. And I remember that even then I wondered about this a little bit. I mean, I said, <laughs> no, because if, sure. if it's a god, you know, uh, you know, what do I care? There can be a god for every phenomenon. Yeah. But, you know, still we had this feeling that one god somehow unifies everything. So we, we try to do that, right? To, to, to have this thing. So you take, take uh, Einstein's general relativity and you try to expose this to the general public and so on. I, I think that uh, there is no question that the equations of general relativity are more complicated than Newton's equations. But somehow, I feel, and I, I believe you feel, that actually the underlying principle of general relativity is simpler. Because in Newton's, you have this sort of mysterious force that acts at a distance, and it's not clear what it means, and so on. And in general relativity, suddenly, it is really all the structure of space that does the whole thing. Are you, are you suggesting that simpler is an aesthetic issue here? Yes, or is I, I believe that in at least in <laughs> physics, I'm, I'm trying to answer But, but that's Brian's part of my question. point. It's not obvious to me that, 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 that Einstein is simpler than Newton. And I think there are many people who would not at first sight come to that conclusion. I do think that after people study differential geometry and study the equations of Einstein and see how they're able to describe so much of the world from a, a very uh, economical starting point, they'll perhaps then they agree with you. Them. But that, but I, that to me may be the evolving aesthetic sense that I'm talking I about so. as opposed to, you know, if I wrote down the equations of Newton on this board and the equation of Einstein on that board, say for this group, uh, I don't know how many people are technically trained, but my guess is that people that are not technically trained, by and large, would think that Newton is a hell of a lot simpler than, than Einstein. And um, I, I agree. And, so what's the common denominator to Keats? Go back to Keats. Isn't, isn't your invisibility equal to truth? Uh, but, the beauty but, uh, coming, emerging from the discovery of the... Uh, maybe so. If, by definition, visibility is, in this limited context, the ability to actually describe what's really out there, yeah. you know. I, th I think the evolution of uh, the aesthetic, corresponding to our understanding, is shown everywhere in the history of mathematics. Uh, in the 16th century, people hated negative numbers. Right. Um, Cardano, when he had an cubic equation, there was this is not a single negative number in his Ars Magna. Uh, if he had a negative number, he would put it on the wrong side, on the opposite side of the equation to make it positive. And the imaginary numbers he called. Uh, and imaginary numbers, he said, he said when he had read. to multiply two ma imaginary numbers, he told his readers, uh, "Be prepared, dismissing mental tortures, right. multiply these things." Uh, so uh, at that point. There was a certain amount of mental, uh, let's say, hardship. And this hardship is, is uh, surely uh, 
shown in a kind of a, a, a aversion, a, an aesthetic aversion for certain uh, aspects of mathematics. I have to tell you that it persists into the 20th century and maybe the 20th century. I had a colleague who hated negative numbers. It turned out her divorced husband was a her divorced husband was a number theorist. <laughs> <laughs> but she hated them. One might. Okay, yeah, you could. But uh, I, I guess my idea was that the minute you understood them, you loved You're them. Born, you right? love but, them yes. And loved them not only in uh, terms of passion, but in terms of aesthetic appreciation. But uh, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I want to say, I, I came here hell-bent on getting a mathematician or a physicist to tell me what seems to be necessary to know in order to talk about beauty in either of these fields, namely what ugliness in them would be. What would be an ugly piece Fine of physics tuning. mathematics? Fine tuning. <laughs> well, okay. if you have a physical so, theory that requires a lot of fine tuning, I don't know if a ugly. single physicist who will think that's beautiful. Well, I, we were, um, I should say, we were supplied with a list of quotations yes. from our hosts, uh, uh, which were uh, which are apt, and I and um, one of them from uh, the mathematician Hardy uh, talks somewhat to that, and I think gives the answer that probably every uh, every um, working mathematician or physicist would would agree to at least. Um, he says that about uh, theory, beauty is the first test. There's no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. So what ugly mathematics really means, at least for Hardy, is unfinished business. Mm. Unfinished business. That is to say that uh, when you see something that's ugly, you uh, sort of train yourself or you get the uh, instinct somehow that you don't leave it. You, uh, you, there is something you do not understand. So ugliness is actually perhaps more interesting than beauty because it leads you to things that you don't understand. I mean, that seems to be the, the moral that you would get from Hardy's uh, quotation. Um, I think, yeah, I think I, you, I, you have a similar view. Well, no? I think I do because it, um, uh, sometimes people have complained that in the little bit of writing I've done on beauty, I don't ever use the word ugly. And it's because it never rings true to me as an opposite for beauty. Um, although what does make a lot of sense is descriptions such as unfinished business. And, uh, and you know, the, going back to, I think, Brian's earlier description of knowing you're on the path to something and, and sensing that there's something there before you're even there. Uh, and so that the state before that is some kind of deficit state, uh, or the, or this, the falling away from it is a deficit state. And that's why I alluded earlier to injury. We don't want to say, oh, well, you know, if you're injured, you're outside the realm of the aesthetic. But I think that we have a deep aversion to injury in the sense that we want to avoid inflicting it. And if we see it, we want to repair it. That is, that we take that to be unfinished business. And if we can't change the injury, let, let's say, if I can't walk, we want to repair the injury so I can walk. And if we can't repair the injury, then we want to revise the world through, let's say, ramps or lifts and buses and so forth, so that that no longer you know, exists as an injury. But I, I think that uh, you know, both those ways of thinking of it as unfinished business or something that requires our address, um, you know, our, our you know, accurate ways of understanding what, what might, might more, uh, you know, I want to say more, more clumsily be referred to as the word ugliness, because I don't think that that word actually uh, you know, is, for me anyway, very useful. OK. Can I, can I ask you a question about um, one of, uh, um, um, a marvelous question you posed to yourself and then to other people um, in uh, one of your essays on beauty and being wrong? 
one point, you discovered <laughs> that your hatred of palm trees was wrong. <laughs> right. And so there's a kind of an aesthetic reversal there. Right. And uh, by the way, the rest of that essay is filled with palm trees. <laughs> um, so you changed, you changed. Right. And it occurred to me, as you were, just as you were speaking, that we might ask everybody, are there moments in, sort of in conceptual realms, uh, ideas, rather than sort of physical objects, where there's something that one hated, and then all of a sudden there's this reversal, and you say, I love it. If it's, uh, for example, the person who hates negative numbers. It might happen at one point Yes. That he will she, have an aha and love it. Yeah. Now, has this ever happened? I mean, it's, there's a number of times it's happened to me, but has it, has it ever happened in, uh, to, to any of us or in the audience? And uh, it, might, it might say something about what we really think beautiful is in, conceptual uh, in a conceptual realm if we focus on a personal moment of reversal. Will, will the opposite do? Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to say, Elaine, although I read your book and appreciated it, I used to think palm trees were rather beautiful. When I was in Miami recently, I thought to myself, they're just a lot of dish mops. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I OK, think, OK, you fight it out. Yeah, no, the, I think that the point I was making is that talking now about the non-mathematical world, that I think the the way the, you know people often say, well, you know, is is the idea that um, was alluded to earlier of Keats' beauty is truth, truth beauty, is that really true? It seems to be true in in math, at least to somebody, a lay person outside of math. Uh, whereas in in most of the world, it it seems as though it has beauty has a relation to truth, but isn't necessarily identical with it, and it was. To make that's what I was trying to get at with yeah. the description of error. That if you most people will remember sometime when they really change their mind about something beautiful in either direction, yeah. either yeah. somebody or something they thought was beautiful. Now, you know, uh, Emily Dickens says it dropped yeah. so low in my regard I heard it hit the ground. You know, <laughs> or or the opposite that uh, that they hadn't recognized something they did and. I felt that this had something to do with the way in which beauty addresses the plasticity of the mind and the, the kind of uh, our ability to, to kind of carry out very limber mental acts. And so I was actually interested by the description that over time there are changes in mathematics because <clears throat> the, the sort of layperson's view of mathematics is that, um, you know, once a proof is there, it, it's never it never changes. And once certain ideas about math are there, they, they don't get altered. And um, I feel as though I'm hearing today that... that Both from Mario yeah, and Brian exactly. and, yeah. and, and that this me, is that, very that changing. it's a moving target. Yeah, it's a moving, moving target. target, yeah. And it somehow tracks something about comprehension or, yeah? It's, in mathematics, I think it's slightly more complicated than that in the, in the following sense. I'll, I'll, I'll use an example that is a well-known example to mathematicians. But um, for centuries, Euclidean geometry, that's the geometry we learn in school, was regarded not just as a branch of mathematics. Euclidean geometry was space. Space was Euclidean geometry. People like Immanuel Kant, you know, said there is no way to describe space other than Euclidean geometry. And then in the 19th century, something shocking happened. Three mathematicians independently, Carl Friedrich Gauss in Germany and Janusz Boja in, in Hungary and uh, Nikolai Lobachevsky in Russia, showed that they can drop one of the basic axioms of Euclidean geometry, and they can construct new types of geometry that look very different. I mean, you can construct them on a sphere, or you can construct them on, a, on a something curved like a saddle, and so on. But that those geometries provide an equally good description of space, like Euclidean geometry. So in some sense, 
the whole thing became a little bit like a game. I mean, you know, like I tell you the rules of chess. We play chess. I change the rules. We play a different game. So give me a, one set of axioms. It would give me Euclidean geometry. I change the axiom. It would give me another type of geometry and so on. So in that sense, this was really a revolution in mathematical thinking. But the way that mathematicians at the end think about this is that it is not that Euclidean geometry suddenly was wrong. Right. Euclidean geometry remained absolutely true in the part of phase space, if you like, in which you know its axioms hold. It just got incorporated into a bigger body of geometries and so on, which you know eventually Einstein used and so on, and we use today almost every day. So what you said is true in the sense that you know, we still calculate the area of a sphere, at least in Euclidean geometry, by the same formula that Archimedes used at 200 BC. We, we have not changed that. But branches get incorporated into bigger things and bigger things and bigger things, and mathematics becomes richer and more complex. Does affect play a role in any of this? I mean, what does affect? For instance, we, you know, disharmony in music. When people first heard Schoenberg or the 12 tone music or Bartok, they were surprised. But now people would f sometimes find harmonization to be a form of predictability, and they prefer cacophony, or they prefer this or aleatory music. I mean, we have uh, the mentality changes the concept. I mean, if we're dealing with what makes us think about what's beauty, beautiful. Yeah. Right. No, I absolutely uh, think so. Um, yeah. That's part of I think with with the evolution that we're talking about. I think that's a, a perfect analogy. Um, but you know, to go. To, to the specific question that you asked, you know, in terms of personal yes, moments, yes, yes. maybe just spend one minute just giving yeah. you two. Yeah, sure. uh, you know, in quantum mechanics, uh, before I learned it formally, I'd heard about this so-called many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, where there are many possibilities allowed by quantum mechanics, and the idea is that each one of the possibilities allowed would actually take place in a different universe. You know, so if you're thinking about going left or right, in the, the actual biggest picture of things, you do both. You go left in one universe, go right. When I first heard about this, it felt like the, the worst possible theory I'd ever, ever heard about it. So uneconomical, so laden with baggage, so, so much stuff being injected from the outside. But then when I formally learned quantum mechanics and learned the mathematics behind it and learned that actually that interpretation of quantum mechanics is the tightest mathematical description. It's the one that has the least additional baggage. My view of it flipped completely, because all of a sudden, this was the one that didn't require extra assumption, didn't require extra baggage. So it's still somewhat problematic, and it's still an active area of research, but that certainly was a moment where I flipped around. Mm -hmm. The other direction was an interesting one where uh, I was taking a course at Harvard, um, Math uh, 106, with one Barry Mazur. Uh, and um, you know, it, was, it was a fantastic course, but I don't know if you remember, there was an interesting oh, moment yeah. for me. It happened in your office. Uh, oh, oh uh, I don't remember it was, this. It was, during, it was during office hours. Um, Good. When we were doing Galois theory, we were doing Galois, Galois theory, theory yeah. and uh, we were learning about field extensions yeah. and how to solve equations yep. and uh, by you know adding various roots and so on and um, uh, you gave us a great problem and uh, you know, I'd worked a long hard and you know come to the answer you know uh, you know bring out you know various roots of unity and, and radicals and so on and and it just struck me and I came to you and asked you that I said I've done all this calculation but I feel like the way that we solve the problem is just by introducing a new symbol that solves the problem and, um, and you thought for a minute and you said, that's sort of right. That, that's, that's really, in some sense, what it is. At that moment, it just struck me that, well, at least certain mathematics, it just felt like it was just pushing around symbols. And they were important symbols and they meant something. But nevertheless, it was just marks on a page. And then, on the other hand, when you could use those marks on a page to describe the universe, that felt to me so much more compelling. And that, and that was sort of a, a flip for me, in a sense. OK, well, uh, look, there's a, some high school math student put on the internet a joke. And the joke is so close to one of the deep ideas of Kronecker. Here's the joke, and then I'll tell you the deep ideas of Kronecker. The joke is, uh, it's, um, it's a piece of a problem, clearly homework problem, that says problem five. Then there's a right angle triangle, 
And uh, the two uh, non-hypotenuses are labeled. And there's an x on the hypotenuse. And the text by the x is find x. And <laughs> you can see the joke. There's a, a sort of a scrolled pen with an arrow <laughs> pointing to the x on the hypothesis. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, that's one way of uh, viewing the symbol. Kronecker's view is slightly different, uh, but very close. Uh, for example, if you want to solve the equation uh, x squared minus 2 equals 0, you might laboriously uh, try to compute this, and you'll discover that it's the square root of 2, and you will discover that it looks like 1.4 if you're thinking of it. Kronecker says the essence of the solution of that equation is that whatever a solution it is, x, oh, sorry, it, um, whatever, whatever it is, it is a symbol which has the property that its square is 2. And if you're an algebraist, if you merely use that, that is to say, if you, so to speak, retreat from the content a tiny bit, blind yourself to the content, and you algebraize the situation, you have a symbol, you don't know anything about it, except you know that its square is 2, you will learn much more about that symbol sometimes than if you knew that it was 1.4, 1.4, etc. This, uh, there's, a, there's, an, there's a literary uh, a, analogy here in um, you know, the Russian literary critics. Um, uh, Viktor Shklovsky has a, uh, um, a thing that he calls algebraization in literature. And what it is is uh, having language retreat from content so as to produce the shape of things. Yeah. At one point, he calls it putting the object in a velvet bag so that you see its profile, but you're not blinded to the particulars of the thing. I think that's what I was right. telling you in office hours. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I should have stayed in mathematics. <laughs> uh, Barry, as you know, there's a theory of the uh, understanding of mathematics as symbolic abstraction in its very nature. That is to say, as a, as a way of being allowed to say and to pretend to think things which you're actually not thinking, but only saying. And that works. That's, that's what's remarkable. That's, that's algebraization, works. if yes. you want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the, I mean, this panel, this uh, round table is called Mathematics and Beauty. It's not called something else and beauty. And over the years in conversations with mathematicians and even in conversation with you, this idea of beauty as something that mathematicians are preoccupied with, connected to, feel empathy towards, or feel somehow their work is more beautiful. I don't know. I'm still trying to understand why there is a particular relationship between mathematics and beauty. The examples that you gave, you, gave, you talked about intuition. And you talked about the discovery of the proton after you've well, we do that in psychoanalysis, but we never have round tables called psychoanalysis and beauty. <laughs> Maybe you should. Maybe we should. But in other words, the notion of uh, beauty in the way that mathematicians seem to see doesn't enter into other. So what is that special connection? Let me, let me try a little bit my hand in, in this. Uh, and it has, as I, when I, in my opening remark, I said that there are yes. a number of aspects to this. So let, let me try first the simplest aspect. Uh, you have a problem to solve. L let's take a very, very simple problem so that you don't need to be a mathematician at all to understand. I, I have a piece of chocolate. It has uh, 18 squares, let's say. How many snaps do I need to make to get the 18 squares? You can think about this or try this and so on, but if you think about this a little bit, you realize that every time you snap, you get one more piece than you had before which means that to get 18 squares, I need to snap 17 times, because that's it. Uh, so this type of thing, when you realize this surprising way of thinking about something, 
This is one of the times that mathematicians will say that there is beauty in that. There is a very famous theorem of Euclid that there is an infinite number of prime numbers. These are the numbers that are divisible only by themselves and, and by one. Or, or, or if you like, you, you mentioned square root of two. OK, OK. So let, square, to show that square root of two is not a rational number. A rational number means it's, there are two numbers, two integer numbers, p and q, that square root of two is equal to p over q. Okay? There are many, many proofs of this. But I'll give you one proof, which I think I can say even in words. I don't need to write on paper. You say square root of t equals p over q. So p equals square root of 2 times q. And I square the 2. I get p squared equals 2q squared. Now, we know that every integer can be decomposed into a multiplication of primes. So p squared, which is p times p, each one of them is a multiplication of primes. So they all come in pairs, because there is p and there is another p. So they all have pairs. q squared on the other side has the same. But there is the 2 which is unpaired, which means that this cannot be. So it's a contradiction, and I prove the theory. So these types of intuitions, if you like, mathematicians see as, as very beautiful. Now, one other thing I mentioned at the beginning was this business of passive effectiveness. And, and, and uh, Brian talked about this a little bit. I was slightly surprised when Barry actually said that mathematicians want to explain things, because I thought that mathematicians most of the time don't want to explain anything. <laughs> um, they, they, <laughs> I it's mean, the job. Physicists <laughs> try to explain. I mean, mathematicians. So I, 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 want, I, so I, I want to give you, I, I want to give you a, a little story, OK? In the middle of the 19th century. I'm going to, as a moderator, I'll separate these two. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of the 19th century, we, we didn't have a clue what atoms were. And then came one physicist, Lord Kelvin. And Lord Kelvin was so fascinated by smoke rings, you know, that they are stable, they can vibrate, that he suggested that atoms are really knotted tubes of ether. Ether was that substance that was supposed to permeate everything. So in other words, you know, every atom is some sort of a knot in an ether, OK? So there is one knot that is the hydrogen atom, another knot is, is you know, oxygen atom, and so on. Now, in order to be able to classify atoms, you know, to create something like a periodic table, somebody needed to be able to classify knots. Namely, to tell, is this knot and this what are they different or are they the same and I can manipulate one into the other? And that was done. There was a mathematician, Peter Guthrie Tate, who sat down for 20 years and managed to tabulate all the knots with up to 10 crossings in them. Just up to 10. In 20 years, it took. Can you believe it? I mean, there, are, there can be knots with an infinite number of crossings. He only managed to classify all the ones with up to 10 crossings. By the time he finished classifying up to 10 crossings, nobody believed anymore that that's a model for the atom. So you might have thought, according to Barry, that at that point, <laughs> Mathematicians will leave the subject because the motivation was no longer there. No, this is exactly when they got really interested in knots. But you know, I, I and, okay. and they started wor working on knots, you know, and so on. And then, for example, in 1984, a, a New Zealander mathematician, Vaughan Jones, who works at Berkeley actually, uh, discovered something which is called the Jones polynomial, which is uh, like an algebraic expression that's a bit like the fingerprint of a knot. It identifies a knot in, in a very nice way. Okay? But all of this was done with no application whatsoever in mind. And then a number of things happened. One thing that happened, biologists, you know, by then already knew that the DNA is a double helix, and so on. And when cells need to divide, then 
this double helix needs to unknot itself in order to copy itself, and then it knots itself back, and so on. And so that they needed, and enzymes do that work. Enzymes pass one strand through the other, you know, and so on and so forth. They discovered that there are mathematicians that they will show them two DNA configurations, and the mathematicians will tell them at what rate the enzymes do the work because they knew all these operations of transforming one knot to the other. More than that, this Jones polynomial became suddenly very important in string theory, you know? The interactions of these strings, you know, can be explained by the, So this is a sense of incredible beauty. I mean, here is something, you know, people were doing it for fun, if you like. And suddenly it turns out to be, <laughs> That's the definition of Philotadian. Explain, <laughs> explaining, you know, something so fundamental as interactions of strings. And there is really, there is nothing more beautiful than this. There is something very interesting. I mean, uh, you're, you're right. It is fun. Not theory is fun, and it's, it's magnificent mathematics. But it is the basis of three-dimensional geometry. I mean, it's the essence of three-dimensional topology. And anyone who, who, who has to deal with, three, uh, with three-dimensional spaces, which are immensely complex, will uh, be looking for that concept, which in number theory is very much like prime numbers. And the concept in geometry that corresponds to prime numbers is not. So, uh, just as one is uh, fascinated if one is doing numbers, fascinated by the series 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13, and so on, as the building blocks of numbers, so uh, you would have to be dealing with, in other words, it is fundamental. It's fundamental. I, I agree. And, and the fact that it applies to string theory, um, uh, well, is an I, added I would bonus. say, uh, wh is an why added not? Bonus. What? It's a, an added bonus. No, I would expect it to apply to anything that would have well, that, that that gets to geometry in a in a in a fundamental way. I mean, but some of the description you were giving, you were answering the question why math has beauty in a way that you're saying psychoanalysis isn't so usually connected with beauty. Well, we never talk about psychoanalysis right. and beauty, but we have mathematicians have something with beauty for some reason. Yes. But so. you know, this, this example of the square root of two, I, I, I remember once reading an essay, and now this is 20 years ago I read the essay, so anybody who's read it more recently can correct me, but it was by the mathematician Seymour Papert. And it was trying to describe the aesthetic pleasure of, of math. And I think he was using solving for the square root of 2, or maybe it was the square root of minus 2. But he described the way in which the 2 keeps appearing and disappearing on the other side of the equal signs, and sometimes as a superscript, and sometimes as the, the number by which you have to multiply things. And uh, he was arguing that it had to do a lot with uh, a sense of play and almost a kind of theatrical play where things are making entries and exits that you didn't explain, which that, that you didn't anticipate, which does actually coincide a little bit with your description and with your description of the surprise at making the snaps and the chocolate. But here's my question. Why wouldn't something like, and I don't know anything about psychoanalysis, but why wouldn't that description also be, you know, why wouldn't it travel out to other realms um, as well? I mean, I have half a thought on that, uh, which I think perhaps it really does, and it may just be cultural linguistic difference in, in, in how the terms are used. But I think at, at the base of all the examples that are, are being given, to me, is the following experience. And the experience is you go from utter confusion suddenly to complete clarity. And it's that move where you're in this fog of not really understanding how many snaps of the chocolate or understanding, you know, Galois theory, whatever it is. And all of a sudden, the pattern becomes clear. I mean, ultimately, we're pattern seekers. And you're, you're in this mist of not understanding. And all of a sudden, by virtue of thinking about things a little bit differently, mm -hmm. it snaps into clarity. Mm -hmm. And I think that is sort of the moment where we say, oh, wow, that, that 
that's beautiful. And I think that probably happens in a lot of other fields too. The one thing that for me is different, and I think this is really ultimately a personal choice, personal aesthetic sense, I'd like to have those moments, and the ones that are most meaningful to me are when I feel like the pattern that's emerged is, is you know, this perhaps contradicts what I was saying before, but has a sense of that it's eternal. Right. Now, I know that it's not, but it has a sense of going beyond Earth, going beyond human society and touching something that transcends it all. And yes, there are aesthetic sense that will evolve over time. And you know, what is a good theory today in physics probably isn't going to be a good one 10,000 years from now. But you have the sense of touching something beyond the everyday. And it's when you go from that confusion to clarity in a domain where you feel like you're touching something beyond the ordinary, that that is a strong sense of, of beauty. Can you explain? Mm -hmm. It seems to me this must be somehow involved in trying to get at what beauty means in uh, subjects which are essentially thoughtful. Why is it that in explaining what it is that gets to you, you're compelled to use sensory metaphors all the time? Why is that? Well, Clarity at least for me, itself well, I mean, the subject to me is very sensory oriented. And yet it isn't well, something in the Well, I think it all depends on your style. I mean, there are some people in, let me just speak in physics, who really are very equation oriented. Yeah. Their understanding and their process is totally about doing the calculations. And there are others for whom that is more a tool and they, aligned with it, have a parallel picture that's running that gives them an image of, of what's going on. And I veer more towards that. Yeah. Uh, there are others who are far stronger than I am technically and perhaps can get to an answer that I can't get to. But for me, the sense of understanding isn't enough if I can do the equation. Yeah. What, I mean, in physics, the answer may be more compelling, but what about mathematics? Mathematicians talk the same way, and yet they're not really talking about, I mean, clarity has to do with light, right? And, and uh, touching has to do with tangibility. Why? And I'm not merely asking a question. I'm wondering what there is about thinking that is almost unavoidably sensory. There doesn't seem to be such a thing as merely thinking, right? Unless it's cranking. Why is that? I mean, what is it in us that connects our sensibility and our thinking? I think it's. I I think it's, it, it gets to the question of uh, why we, we think of uh, mathematics, which has really abstract concepts, if you wish, at the base, uh, as something that allows us to see things. I mean, it gets back to your, your, your um, mentioning the visibility Taken in some metaphorical sense. It is a metaphor. It's a metaphor, but uh, we have no other vocabulary to say uh, these, uh, to, exp to describe these moments that Brian just described of going from confusion to, to well, clarity. to light. Yeah, to light. And uh, you might say, why don't we have other words for it? And it might be for some deep reason that. Uh, there are no other words for it. I mean, that is, it's, it may be stronger than the usual metaphorical use of I see. I, oh. Well, I was going to say, I agree with Barry that you've circled <coughs> us back to your initial comment about visibility in the Phaedrus. And I don't think that Plato means that to be metaphorical, because he says the special generosity of beauty is that it does make itself available in the sensory world. And I know that a lot of mathematics and physics is absolutely beyond the sensory horizon. But these moments that are being described are always moments when it suddenly has come within the bowl of perceivable space as though it were you know, this round table. Um, the only other thing I can think of is that there are, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, it's, what you're saying makes so much sense. And yet when you drive it, to its conclusion, it means that when mathematicians speak of beauty, they're speaking of falsity. 
<laughs> because that's exactly not what they are really doing. You know, Einstein once was once asked in an interview. You know, Einstein was notorious for making many mistakes. Uh, he, he kind of knew what the final answer should be, but along the way, he would make lots of mistakes, actually. His papers are peppered with mistakes. Uh, and he was once asked later in, a, in an interview, how is it possible that he still manages to get to the right answer at the end? And he said, I'm now quoting him, that he was always trying not to think in words at all. Because words lead you to possible contradictions and things and so on. And he just thinks in images. And this leads him to the, to the right answer. So that, in a way, is what you, know, you have been saying. I mean, that you know, it's these images that, uh, that drive us. So, so even mathematicians, even when they you know, work with the equations and so on, they probably, there is some sort of image that, that drives them. It's, it's not maybe the thing that is exactly written it on the paper at, at that very moment. It's a priori well, stuff, it's, isn't it? Though, aren't we talking about a mathematics predicated in synthetic a priori kind of you know, knowledge that is in the brain that, that, and laws that can be, you know, for which you don't need an empirical. Well, one of the, one of the uh, can I, let me first respond to One of the big thing, changes in mathematics occurs when it's a viewpoint that's changed. It's a whole uh, way of, way of, I, I, I hate to use the word seeing things because it's begging the question, but that's the only, that's the only word that comes, comes to mind. But I'll, I'll use the word viewpoint without uh, uh, emphasizing the view aspect of it. It's finding a perch so that when, when you see, what you see is a much larger terrain. And you see it clearly. I mean, to explain means to turn to a plane in some sense. And it's, you, you, see, you see things uh, in a way. Uh, OK, what is, what is vision? vision? Oh, but that must be what you mean by beauty, because yeah. what you described, the first part, everybody has that. You are confused, and you discover something, and suddenly a lot of things make sense. We have that sure. regularly. But there's something more you said, and that must be then why mathematicians talk about beauty, what you just said. It could be that, that, you, that there's a panorama that, that you didn't imagine that you could see, and now you see. It's like coming to Kansas after uh, uh, the East Coast or something. why it seems to me but That's a beautiful. Kind of self <laughs> <laughs> I was kidding. I was kidding. It is beautiful, actually. A kind of yeah. self-delusion, yeah. even yeah. A, a, a falsification. People will say uh, when they're studying Lobachevsky, "Yeah, I can see it," and they draw it. They go to the board. You know, our students will study Lobachevsky, and they go to the board, and now they draw two parallel lines that meet. What are they drawing? One straight line and one bent line. That's a falsification. <laughs> they, they, they mean a straight line, but in order to, to see it, they have to draw a false one. Or, or they say, oh, yeah, you can do it on a, on a saddle. Or, of the blackboard. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you can do it on a saddle exactly. or on a torus. Exactly. Turn the yeah. blackboard into a saddle. They're looking they would at have a piece no of problem. Euclidean space. <laughs> They're not seeing. You're trying to project. Yeah, yeah I agree. You, you agree. <laughs> so, I mean, so what? What is it that it takes to say that mathematics is beautiful? It takes a kind of devotion to to the same metaphor that philosophers employ when they say "I see," when they mean. What do they mean? <laughs> I think we're focusing on this. Yeah. They think they see, but the mathematicians actually see. <laughs> I, I think, by the way, that part, or may, maybe part of the reason that you, in psychoanalysis, I don't know, don't, uh, at, le at least the things that uh, w when mathematicians do something and when theoretical physicists do something, I think at the end of the day, the places when we say that things are beautiful are those when what we deal with 
uh, deals with something that is truly fundamental. It's, it's the words that Brian uses that it has, a, you know, it's forever. Even if it's not forever, but that it deals with something that is truly fundamental. You know, this is, this is what drives the universe at large and the universe at small, you know, and so on. And the, the, these types of things. When we deal with much more complex phenomena, when fluid dynamics solve the equations of fluid dynamics, I, I don't think you hear the word beautiful so often. Uh, maybe you hear it when they discover something like a Feigenbaum number, which is some sort of universal numbers that appears in all transitions to turbulence or something. But when they just solve something that's really complex, uh, Beauty is not mentioned as often as that. And psychoanalysis, by the nature of the beast, I mean, it still deals with very complex systems and so on. So maybe this is why. I, I'm just venturing well, here a, a possibility. Uh, well, I don't know. There are some famous, uh, uh, famous problems about turbulence or famous problems about solutions of uh, 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 but they are the equations. ones that deal with the, probably with the more fundamental things, as opposed to, OK, oh, yeah, I yeah. just also solved this stream hitting this wall, and I don't know what. I think, I think you're using the word fundamental in such a um, general sense that, it's, uh, that it, uh, it, it really does correspond to what mathematicians value as well. That is, uh, it doesn't have to be a fundamental fact of physics to be fundamental. It could be a fundamental way of thinking. Yes. Could it not be? Yeah. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we now have two words. We have visible and fundamental. And there's beauty sort of sitting in the wings there. And to some extent, uh, beauty is attached to things that are fundamental. Beauty is attached to things that are less, let us, lets us see far and wide at, this, at the same time. Um, and I guess one of our problems in discussing it is we don't know to what extent uh, the metaphor can be sharpened. I mean, isn't, that, isn't that the issue? That's your, your question, I think. Yes. One way in which beauty is fundamental in non-mathematical areas. I'm also aware that we we said we would open up things I up think, to the audience. Yeah, maybe, so maybe we should. Maybe huh? we should just. We should. Finish with the okay. Check. Well, I was just going to say that in and this might not uh, seem this might not apply to math, but in in uh, literature and philosophy, often there's a claim that uh, there's a kind of life pact between the beautiful thing and the observer. And I mean, Diotima <clears throat> told Socrates, who told Plato, who tells us that when you see someone or something beautiful, or if, if you see somebody beautiful, it can give rise to the desire to have children, um, or to write poems, or to write legal treatises, or philosophic treatises. And, there are many later statements that talk about this kind of generative impulse. For example, Augustine talked about music as um, a life-saving plank in the middle of the sea. And Dante wrote a book called The New Life and so on. And you know, there's, there's this, even though there's lots of variations in poetry over time um, or, or artworks over time in what is being validated, there often is this kind of affirmation of this basic fact of, of aliveness. And uh, so I was wondering if something like that could uh, be at the heart of mathematics as, as well. Is it being alive in the, in the mind? Or is that yeah, yeah, or yeah, or just, the, just, I mean, the, uh, uh, of course, if you see something beautiful, let's just say the autumn leaves today or something. So you're saying it's a, that beauty can be arousal. Yeah, that yeah. it is this li yeah. pushing perception yeah. to a higher level of acuity, yeah. and um, and and conversely, it it, uh, it it instigates in you the desire to carry that thing forward in time, to protect it and nourish it, or make sure the theory, the account gets out 
to other people. Um, so, you know, in in that way, it could be. Yeah, similar. I mean, if, if I wasn't ashamed to do it, I'd ask the people, the mathematicians here, whether there's an erotic element to doing mathematics. I'm glad you're ashamed too. I'm glad <laughs> <you're> ashamed. <laughs> I think on, on that note we can we can <laughs> open it to question. Uh, you got to come up if you want to make a question. You have yeah. to come up to the mic. Yeah, we have to yeah. capture you. Uh -huh. uh, well, it seems to me the last minute or two of discussion seemed to really get to at least from my perspective. Can you say who you are. Everyone say uh, who they Michael are. Michael who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, really get to the heart of the matter because the one thing that you really haven't been touching on, although you've been going around it is the emotions that accompany the thought that something is beautiful. Now, obviously, in each one of your fields, you're very passionate people about it, that when you do see something as, as beautiful, there's an emotion that accompanies that. And that goes with the solution of a problem, bringing things into visibility. And I even think in a psychoanalytic realm, if you were to talk to a psychoanalyst who's dealing with a patient, and all of a sudden there's an insight there that came, that would be accompanied by an emotion. And an emotion would be a very pleasurable emotion, which gets back to Eva talking about why do you always talk about, uh, about, about it from a matter of sense. Yes. Why are the metaphors so central? Because that's the feeling that accompanies it, and I think what you just said about uh, the idea of being alive. This is a f that feeling is really fundamental to existence and certainly a craving that feeling. So that the kind of, when you talk about labeling something as, as beautiful, it's almost like falling in love. You really can't put it into words, but it's there and you know it and it's positive. I actually agree very much with, with what you said. Uh, and what you said also reminded me that, you know, we are now fortunate that people can do things that in previous centuries they couldn't. Namely, they can do functional MRIs of brains of people who do various things. And they did find that uh, when people see things which they describe as beautiful, the same area of the brain is activated is the one that is activated by addictions, for example. You know, if you're very hungry and you suddenly get food, or if you need drugs, and so on, it's the same area of the brain. So uh, I, I think you're right. Uh, you're, you're probably right. And we probably also have the same thing and as we reach some certain solution and so on in this. And of course, the oxytocin then is then, you know, flowing and things like that and so on, yes. Uh, just uh, tell us your name, and uh, you know I'd like to get to know people. Uh, tell us, tell, tell us what you do, uh, what, what your profession. Retired teacher. Okay, go ahead. I know there's one term that hasn't been used that mathematicians use quite often is the term elegance. Now, it hasn't been mentioned at all, and that surprised me. And what I want to notice is, can a mathematical or physical theory? be elegant and beautiful if it's counterintuitive to the way our mind works, in particular, quantum theory? Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> well, well, that is a word I'm, I'm fond of. Um, and, um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I do, th I do think, in fact, um, some of the, the most powerful moments where that word would be relevant would be exactly the ones that you're describing where you, know, you were talking about that switch from seeing things one way to seeing things another way. Um, the most spectacular moments as a physicist, and I'm sure in any discipline it's the same, are the ones when you learn something about the universe that's verifiable, experimentally or observationally verifiable, that's completely counter to the way you would have thought things work. And quantum mechanics is the primary example of that. So to me, quantum mechanics is the most spectacularly beautiful, the most fantastically elegant structure that our species has ever created. Because it is so completely counterintuitive, it is absolutely nuts, but it's right. And that is spectacular. But what about the conflation between general relativity and quantum? Theory? Well, that is a thorn in the side, isn't it? Uh, and, and, and that's where uh, that's, that's what gets you up in the morning and keeps you going. And, and, and so that's a great thing to have. I mean, if everything was solved, 
you know, it could have been the case that the world, say, was just Newton or just quantum mechanics. It could have been that way. And I have to tell you, I thank, I don't know, God or whatever, I, you know, I thank the fact that the world is not just Newton or Einstein or quantum mechanics because it gives us something to do. Uh, and it's such a fun thing to do. Uh, but it could have been simpler and it could have all been solved. And, and thankfully it hasn't. Thank you. Thanks, I'd like to ask a question. I'd like to ask a question linking to the visibility uh, point. You mentioned not theory, Galois. Uh, um, I'm very curious about the role of nomenclature in the way of shaping thinking. Because the symbols you use to express things might influence the way you choose to do operators, etc. And of course, your book on, on you symmetry. The microphone? Your book on symmetry deals with that question explicitly. So I'd just like to get a sense of what role the nomenclatures you use and choose play in your aesthetic sense, but also in solving the problem sense. If there's any kind of an alignment there. Can, uh, you could can I answer that? Something. Well, I mean, two of the most brilliant pieces of nomenclature that um, mathematics has is. Both of them are due to Leibniz. Uh, one of them is captures in a, a symbol, which is almost a, a Chinese hieroglyph, all of differential calculus. And the other captures in another Chinese hi hieroglyph, all of integral calculus, or a good deal of it, where the rules for manipulation of the symbol are somehow packaged in the symbol. So the standard. Uh, well, the, 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 the standard way of, of talking about a derivative. A derivative is you imagine that you're trying to um, compute the instantaneous speed, say, of your car, uh, of, of your, your going. And, and the way you do it is you, you, you would approximate it by computing um, for a certain time interval how far you've traveled. And then you take the ratio of the two. Now, that ratio is not the instantaneous speed at any point uh, that you can name, but rather is an approximation. So to get something more and more exact, you have to take finer and finer time intervals, smaller and smaller time intervals, and um, take a sequence of ratios which you hope will converge to an actual number, which we'll call the instantaneous speed. Now, that number is not a ratio of anything, because you're taking a ratio of fractions where the numerator and denominator are going to 0. So if you thought of that number as a ratio, it would be 0 over 0, which is nothing. Nevertheless, Leibniz used fractional notation to describe this. He called it df over dt. Uh, dt is change of time, and df is change of distance, let's say. And this, it's not a ratio. It's not a fraction. It's something that is described by a sort of a, a theory, if you wish. And yet, contained within it is the seed of the entire theory. You, it's a mnemonic of how you got it. And it's a mnemonic of how you're going to use it, because it, does, it sometimes does play the role of a fraction. And the same with the integral. So uh, in some sense, the, the Is that beautiful when you got it? Well, I, I, I think it's not only beautiful uh, typographically, <laughs> but I actually think that it's conceptually uh, sort of a beautiful move, and also uh, a prod. It says. By golly, when you define something, your, your terminology, your notation is going to have to do work in the future. And you should fashion it, fashion it to be as uh, compact as possible, as mnemonic as possible. It tells you exactly how you got it and how you're going to use it. And yeah, no, it's. I can think of. A uh, case in chemistry. The beginning of chemistry, I think, was in the renaming of the Kabbalistic terms for substances for terms that suggested atomic structure, like hydrogen, which means essentially something that gives birth to water. So that's another case yes. where they term where what they 
they call themselves called neologism made all the difference. Yeah. Before you ask your question, I wonder if Sarah Ferguson wants to say something about beauty and math. Oh um, yeah, well for me. Well, I'll... could you come go up to, to the mic? Yeah, and then and the then young lady. You yeah, yeah, young lady. Because, that's... because she has her work here and she has her. Um, for for me, I think um, as a as a former mathematician, um, language was really the medium for me. I'm now a painter, so I think of a theorem. I can make draw a parallel between a theorem. And a painting, which means not all theorems are beautiful. <laughs> There's a lot of that. You know. um, and then the proof, the language of the proof is the process or what reveals it. And there is a falsity, I think, in terms of sometimes an elegant proof is one which conceals. <laughs> um, it just does it in an economy of means. In mathematics, um, it was the language always that carried the aesthetic value. And so I did, my first body of work was drawings of uh, what I call the math heads, where I covered them in computations for my research, because that's really what I did. Instead of painting, I was at a desk with tons of paper and pens. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And so for me, it was a very physical thing. Thank you. Great. <laughs> okay. Tell us who you, who you are. Oh, I'm Susan Donovan, and I'm a graduate student at Hunter. Um, what I wanted to ask was, is beauty for physics and mathematics um, necessarily always helpful? Because I, I think about how, how um, Galileo thought that if you had a chain, you were just letting it hang like this. At first, he thought that was a parabola. And it's not a parabola, it's, it's another curve that's based on trigonometry. And it would be kind of more beautiful, maybe, if it was, because parabolas are so simple. That's that reductivism you talked about. So what about, what about that other side of beauty, when it leads you in the wrong direction, because you just want it to be simple? So, so that can happen. Uh, it, it can happen. Uh, sometimes later, we realize that what we thought was not beautiful actually was a misunderstanding. So I, so, so yeah, that, I, that's the evolving sense. That's yes. Exactly so I will give you I will give you an example based on the same thing that you just uh, 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 not on the chain. The chain was solved yes by Bernoulli and others, but um, but also from Galileo. Galileo absolutely dismissed the idea that he was a correspondent of Kepler. And Kepler discovered that the orbits of the planets are not circles, that they are ellipses. And Galileo couldn't believe that. And the reason he couldn't believe this was exactly the reason that you said, because circles were supposed to be these absolutely perfect shapes. And therefore, how could the orbits of the planets be anything other than those perfect shapes? Now, here is where later we understand that there is a misunderstanding. Galileo also had in mind the symmetry. And he thought, but he thought in terms of a symmetry of a shape. A circle has the, this symmetry that you rotate it however you rotate it, and it looks the same. Instead, what we discovered later was that <coughs> Newton's laws and the laws of physics in general have this symmetry in them under rotations, but it is a symmetry of the law, not of the shape. Namely, in the, in the case of the orbits, the orbit can be an ellipse. The shape it, it's not, is not so important. But that ellipse can have any orientation it wants in space. And all of those are allowed orbits. Now, had Galileo realized that that's what he should have been thinking about, I believe he would have agreed that this is even more beautiful than the <laughs> circle. That's good. That's good. But at the time, he thought about the shape, the symmetry of the shape. So occasionally, Occasionally, we think that, it, oh, it should be like this. It turns out to be different, which looks le less beautiful. But then our sense of beauty also evolves. We understand that there is a deeper sense in which we still regard this to be beautiful. Thank you. 
take the next question. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name is uh, William Moick, and I used to be a student of Miss Bronze uh, long ago. And I have a, a question about her uh, citation of the Phaedrus, because I came half expecting today to hear a lot about music and instead heard nothing. Uh, so in citing uh, Plato about the uh, beauty being uh, visual, I, I wonder, well, what happens to music in that definition? Is it left out, or is there some way of reading his words to accommodate for that? Well, I would say that the first great mathematical theory, which is that of ratios and proportions, was in fact a musical theory. That is, the Pythagoreans discovered that consonances had to each other small number ratios, and that the composing of those ratios resulted in the uh, diatonic scale. So the very first great mathematical theory has its a very definite beauty of an audible one. So I, I'm glad you brought it up. I think you're showing your education here. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say hello. Thank you. And I, and I think, by the way, that, that Plato, I mean, I don't know what you would think of it, but I think that Plato's actual term at that moment is beauty is, is uh, clearly discernible. Clearly discernible. And I, I think he means it's within, it becomes within the sensory horizon. And I don't think that that would mean that it has to be visual as opposed to auditory. No, he doesn't mean no. visual that yeah. way. No. Yeah. He means. I'm Lynn Gamwell. I'm a historian and I'm a writer. Uh, and uh, many of us were here a couple weeks ago. We heard a, uh, we did a program on um, mathematics and the divine, and heard about the traditional association of mathematical objects with uh, religious issues because they exist outside time and space, and they're perfect and eternal. So on. And um, and I wondered if if uh, our mathematicians and physicists could comment on the uh, the issue of the difference between um, uh, uh, when when you come to a realization between revelation and reason? Uh, well, Brian? Uh, <laughs> uh, Brian, Brian already, already invoked a vocabulary that is almost um, of that spirit. Mm -hmm. That's that what say, prompted me. That one is looking for universals, mm -hmm. things that are so uh, Unbound in culture, so unbound in un, uh, um, de independent of language, independent of culture, independent of time. It's the sort of uh, it's the sort of ideas that anyone who uh, meanders through the cosmos will eventually come across. Now, I don't know whether there's uh, you need to put a theistic. Uh, overlay on that, but it certainly is a, a kind of a companion thought to some of the um, uh, some of the more religiously described uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of revelatory um, uh, and, and notions about the natural philosophy. I don't know whether but anybody else... Have one, but, but I think the power of the experience, at least the one that I was alluding to, is it's not just the moment of revelation per se, but it's the fact that that moment of clarity is distinctly founded upon a chain of reasoning and explanation that gives you a complete sense of understanding as opposed to acceptance. And that's the key thing, that you can see the full chain from something that is so basic that you feel it almost doesn't need explaining through the chain of explanation to this completely unexpected place. It's not just the unexpected place coming down on high and imposing itself upon you as some revealed truth. It's the fact that you understand the linkage by which you believe it. Right, you prepared yourself. And, and, and itself comes in a package where you only have a sense of the power of the moment because you can see why it's true, mm -hmm. not because someone tells you it's true. Exactly, yeah. And, and I, I might add that you also know that whatever idea or theory or whatever you came to, you, you will only consider it to be an acceptable theory if it is actually also falsifiable. Mm -hmm. That you can actually make predictions based on that, and you can test those predictions in the future. Can, 
can I have one comment sure. too, uh, unrelated? Um, uh, just to remind us, with the issue of visibility of uh, uh, Plato's metaphor of the cave, of, of the sun makes the visible world visible, and the way in which the form of the forms makes the mental world yes. understandable. Yes, it's yeah. in the Platonic context. You're right. Mm -hmm. Olga, and then this yeah. 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 Olga. Okay. I'm a conceptual artist. My name is Olga Ast, and I, <clears throat> in art, we already really don't like uh, things that are too beautiful. Too beautiful for us is negative term. And what we, <laughs> yeah. what, and what we usually say about what we like is great work, is great idea, is great, solu uh, great solution we don't say, but actually it's very close to your definition of great solution of new opening, what we see in this. Even it's too be beautiful, it, it's already on commercial side. It's, it's, you could uh, suggest it to general public and said, oh, okay, you can buy it. It's, it's very beautiful on your, on your. But my question is actually to psychoanalytic uh, here, because, because once I talked to several people about uh, also beauty and science, and a lot of people saying that beauty is something that you uh, enjoy, but it's not it's not really correct because you could <clears throat> you could, for example, be scared of hurricane, but consider it's very beautiful. So, and in this discussion, kind of after this discussion, I came to conclusion that beauty is, we probably should um, treat sense of beauty as a separate emotion. That, and if it's separate emotion, that it's very subjective, well, like um, uh, Galilei considered that perfect symmetry is beautiful, but now we don't consider perfect symmetry is beautiful. It's actually uh, go of the symmetry. It's probably much more interesting and beautiful for us. It's gay, gay. Give us new or give us a new opening. So my question is: Should we consider sense of beauty as a separate emotion, like, for example, suffering? <laughs> That's it. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the, the problem is that when we mean in the case, in the sense that you describe beauty, it also could be said it gives you some sense of pleasure. And so it falls under the general category of pleasure, just as suffering is on the other side. My impression was, and the question I was asking earlier on, which I think I have some answer to, is that mathematicians mean by beauty something beyond mm. just this subjective sense of something is beautiful. That, and that, that, that aspect of it that is beyond, because as I said before, there are times in my work when something comes out of me as an intuition, I have no idea where it comes from. It ends up being so correct that it opens up a number of things that up to that point I had not seen and my patient had not seen. But yet I don't end up that session thinking, gee, wasn't this beautiful? <laughs> so I have a feeling there is something more to what they mean by beauty than this kind of subjective feeling of enlightenment, insight, uh, good, uh, just a sense of well-being. They mean something more. Can I, can I protest briefly the, the account of art you gave, um, which is uh, a view you hold and is a very reputable view held by um, you know, many major artists. But I want to contest it. Um, and and the, the, you know, for, for many decades, Beauty was banished from humanities departments and universities, and also from museums, and also from art studios, and also from architecture schools. And in all these sites, lots of people now say that's wrong, that um, beauty, beauty needs to be uh, accredited, because what we've all been looking at from the past uh, are very beautiful objects. And I mean, it, it's not that one of us is right and one of us is wrong, but I just want to put the alternative view on the table. Um, the, uh, you know, the, your worry about the commercial, I think, follows from the fact that if everybody vacates the field and won't use the vocabulary of beautiful, you can be sure advertisers will still use it. And that leads to the mistake of thinking 
that if you're suddenly talking about something beautiful, you're talking about something commercial, or to put it another way, when you see something beautiful, the only response is to buy it, rather than, as we've been talking today, if you see something beautiful, it's the time to you know, intensify your research, or the t the, uh, it's the time to you know, educate yourself still further. So it, 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 it's not something we could solve right now, and, but, but I just wanted to state the alternative view. Hi, uh, my name is Liam Cohen. I'm a freshman in high school. Um, I also have a friend who can't really be here right now, so I'm going to ask some questions from him, too, just one. Um, so basically, I've been listening to this roundtable, very interesting, and I'm very happy to be, be able to ask this question in front of such great minds. But my, what it is is what I understood from this is that Beauty is really in the eye of the beholder, so each different mathematician and physicist here has a different view of beauty and how mathematics and physics and bioengineering, how that all relates. In my personal opinion, I feel that beauty in mathematics, in relation to mathematics is, in relation to mathematics, is that mathematics is this bridge between actuality and imagination. And when so a physicist uh, theorizes something or he thinks of something that... Or she. Yes, or she, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when, when they physicize something, or theorize something, they have to use mathematics to prove that. So I see mathematics as this sort of token or bridge in this way to explain the universe. And I think, think of that as beauty, in a sense, where is when I can truly relate imagination and actuality, that to me is beauty. That's just my personal opinion. And I was just wondering how you guys all felt about that and just how you can, how do you think is mathematics as a bridge between imagination and actuality? And also my friend's question is, um, he's saying, as we all know, the solutions to everything in life are infinite through the art of mathematics. But how do you think these advances can be made nowadays or in the near future? So those are my two questions. Thank you. So? so. <laughs> yeah. uh, look, I wonder, no, if, yeah, I mean, if, if I may, uh, you, uh, when you, you said that the question, what is beauty, uh, seems to have a number of answers. Right? Uh, it seems to me there's a distinction that would be, might be interesting to you. It's, one question to ask what things are beautiful, and I'm always amazed at how much unanimity there is about that. What mathematical theories, what physical theories are beautiful. The other question is, what does it mean to be beautiful? And that's where people differ. That's what makes the question interesting. The, if, they, if they were utterly, uh, uh, had utterly different answers to the question, what is beautiful? There wouldn't be much to talk about, but there is something that they regard as beautiful, and that's what makes the question interesting, namely, what is it that makes it beautiful? I want to say one more thing, if you let me. Of course. You said, <laughs> <laughs> you said that's just your personal belief. Never say just your personal belief. That's all you can have as a personal belief, and it's not a just. Concerning yeah. the bridge thing, um, this is actually a very deep question. I don't think I uh, will have time here to discuss it. Uh, but Galileo, for example, is the person who first wrote down a statement which said that mathematics was the language of the universe. In other words, the universe is written in this language of mathematics. When you think about this from today's perspective, that's a little bit ambiguous, this definition, because, for example, if mathematics is really only an invention of the human mind, how did the universe know to be written in this language, which is an invention of the human mind? So, so it becomes quite complicated. And the answer is that mathematics is a bridge. I think the word that you use is, is a very good one. It's a bridge. Uh, but the bridge works in somewhat complicated way because ways, because it, on one hand, we invent mathematical concepts, then we discover relations among them, 
And then we apply those things as models to physical reality. And when that works, we're very happy. When it doesn't work, we actually try something else. So there is a certain natural selection and evolution, if you like, there in the solutions that we apply. And we constantly uh, improve the language that we use. So it's a bridge, but it's not a fixed bridge. I mean, it's a bridge that we work on all the time. It may be a bridge we travel on as well. I mean, that imagination can get closer to the actual is, uh, is amazing, after all. And your, your, your uh, image there is quite, is quite apt, that, that imagination needs something to, uh, to apply itself directly to the largest realm, realm it can possibly apply itself. And for that, it needs uh, conveyances, like bridges. And perhaps mathematics is, uh, is, uh, is that from that point of view. It's a way of conveying the imagination to its broadest reach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, nobody, and I'm doing nothing. <laughs> But you do have a name. No name. I'm trying to give that up, too. My question is a, is a kind of a spiritual one or a transcendental, which you, I think you touched on and you touched on as meaning. And I, what comes to mind listening to you all is St. Thomas Aquinas, who had three functions of beauty. And I wondered if you would relate to that. He said it had to have wholeness, a harmony, and a radiance. What do you think about that? The, I mean, or in some, he used that language. He also used integrity, proportion, and claritas. Mm -hmm. And some of those, I think, I think that claritas or the radiance is one that we have been talking along about all along. That is the the ability of something to just stand forth. And be available, if, even if it's whether it's in the aha moment, or whether it's in a more serene moment. But of course, it could be energy for the physicists. Yeah, and I think that proportion or harmony is audible in the the times when our discussion has touched on the idea of of symmetry or equality or ratio, and wholeness maybe when maybe when. We've touched on the idea of, you know, the aspiration for things that are fundamental, but I'm not sure. Maybe that's the one that we've talked about mm -hmm. least. But also to explain with, with as little as possible to explain as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Do you think that could be transcendental or transformational for us and for you? I mean, is that why you not probe these questions and live this life? Well, Aquinas was, at the moment he gave that three-part definition, he was describing the face of Jesus, if I remember correctly. And he was uh, you know, <coughs> making a larger account of what things are done by the Father, what by the Son, and what by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, maybe this goes back to the earlier question about mathematics and revelation. And, the, uh, the intuition that, that people have that there's, uh, you know, that, that there is something, uh, you know, quite apart from whether one has any specific religious belief, whether mm -hmm. one has something, some sense of, you know, a magical underpinning or a kind of uh, unifying uh, presence. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Jewish and kind. I'm a neuropsychologist. And I can't help but um, offer a little bit of the thinking that you know that someone from my field would uh, would would go through in th listening to this discussion. And um, in a answering the question about beauty, um, the some of the neuroscientists have looked at what people actually found as beautiful, and they find that we have like a running average, a running a sense of a running average of what the norm is, and beauty is a deviation of that average um, in a certain direction. So. 
I mean, think about facial features. It's larger eyes or smaller nose or bigger lips or whatever. And Barbie doll is an example of an exaggeration. A caricature is often considered more like the thing than the real thing. So it was interesting to me that Brian's um, point about asymmetry um, is beautiful because the asymmetry in the universe is, it counts for the universe. And asymmetry is what we pick up on, um, but we pick up it on a given direction. Um, the other point I wanted to mention is um, about the difference between the visualization and the bridge. Um, we understand now that the right side of the brain is, is nonverbal, intuitive, and forms intuition. It forms um, hypotheses about the world. You know what Brian was saying also about visualizing the solution without having the words for it. Um, whereas the mathematical side of the world, which is the left side of the brain, um, comes up with the language. And the two. Are, are both working in their separate processes. And then at some point, there's a ha moment where now I have the words to say what I've been thinking. It's the proof. And we might experience that as a form of beauty. Um, but it's really an alliance of two forms of knowledge that are different from each other, but suddenly come into existence at a certain moment. Can I say that I agree with you entirely, except that mathematics would co-op both sides. <laughs> I mean, the, there's this, um, uh, let's say, um, companionship between geometry and algebra, which began uh, with the Pythagoreans and is continuing today. It's deeper and deeper and deeper. There are two intuitions. One is a geometric visual intuition, and the other is, as you say, ex you described it beautifully, a, a, a verbal algebraic definition, uh, uh, intuition, uh, that there are profound connections between these two. This is an unfinished business even now. I mean, we will, uh, for the next 50 years, be seeing uh, more and more um, fundamental uh, relationships between these two ways of thinking. And each one nourishes the other. Right, right. <coughs> My name is uh, Anthony Liversidge, and I uh, am a science reporter. And uh, to some extent, I specialize in disputes uh, among scientists as to uh, general beliefs and results. And um, I've been looking at the literature of, uh, of CERN's uh, Collider, which uh, is about to start up, supposedly in a month or two, in Switzerland. And uh, as probably many people here know, um, there's a, quite a bit of uh, discussion about whether this would, will end up uh, creating black holes and strangelets, which may or may not reduce the planet either to a molten asteroid the size of a football field, or else uh, maybe even uh, make it uh, reduce it to the size of a marble, and uh, it will disappear down one of these black holes. And uh, I've been looking at the literature of this, and I've noticed that, uh, that uh, it seems to be, to be in, in effect, undecided as to what really will happen once they crank this accelerator up up to levels that, you know, I think it's four times as high as uh, previously. And, uh, and Brian Green uh, <clears throat> wrote this rather gung-ho piece in The Times uh, a year ago, uh, <laughs> saying we should we go full speed ahead with this thing. And, uh, and uh, he offered an argument which uh, has since been uh, admitted by CERN as uh, not any good in terms of defending the safety of this operation. And I wondered, Which therefore, argument was that? What was that? Which argument are you referring to? The cosmic ray argument, uh, saying the, that. The, the atmos Earth atmospheric cosmic ray argument, or the more general one? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, the, the, the argument that um, because cosmic rays uh, are constantly hitting the Earth at uh, high speeds, and uh, that's only half the argument. The other half is equally important. Good. You can't take well, half can away and be delighted if you just expand on that. That's sure. But I just want to say to you what I want to ask you. Um, in the current context, uh, you've hinted at the fact that if something is beautiful, therefore it's probably more likely to be true than not. But it, and you've also said that we have theories of physics today which 
you, you know will be probably replaced in 10,000 years and therefore viewed as wrong or inaccurate. And I wanted to, to know, since it seems somewhat undecided as to what will really happen when they turn on this accelerator, and there are very famous, uh, or at least very reputable scientists who argue very well uh, that it is very dangerous and that apparently their papers are not being read by uh, physicists involved, at least two of them I've asked at NYU had not read Plager's uh, third edition of his paper, which he brought out a month or two ago. I wondered if uh, we could say, well, we don't know what's going to happen because we've never been into this uncharted territory, but the critics' theories are less beautiful than the theories of the people who support going ahead, and therefore we can be confident on that basis. <laughs> As a, <laughs> as a long preamble to, um, but uh, but yeah, sure. Um, y you know, I don't think that you ultimately want to judge. Are you going to take my picture while I'm answering? Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think you want to judge the um, the correctness of theories by any of the aesthetic considerations that we're talking about here today, uh, because ultimately, what will determine whether a theory is right or wrong are its predictions and whether those predictions agree, agree. with data. And I don't care how beautiful a theory is, if its predictions don't agree with data, it's wrong. I don't care how ugly a theory is, if its predictions agree with the data, then I'm willing to accept it as correct. The arguments that have been made for the issue that you're describing are not based on beauty. They're based upon calculations, using our best understanding, as you say, which could change, of how the world works. Now, I should say, based on our best understanding of how the world works, there is a small chance right now that a dragon will appear in this room and swallow us all up and the Earth as well. There's a non-zero chance, according to quantum mechanics, that that will happen. I don't worry about it, and I don't, advocate, I don't advocate that anybody else worries about it either, because the probability is so fantastically small that it isn't worth worrying about. If you worry about that, you should worry about walking out of your house a gazillion times more. And the same kinds of calculations are the ones that have gone beyond our belief that there's not going to be an issue when the switch is thrown. Could we be wrong? Sure. But if we're going to not do things because we're worried about that, we should not get up in the morning. So if you're willing to get up in the morning and get on the subway, then you should be willing to throw the switch. You should be, in fact, much more confident about throwing the switch than getting up and taking the subway. In fact, in fact way, way, way more confident. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, sir, I, sir, I, I think there's another remember, question. Keep, no, 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 we'll go to the next can, question. No, wait, I just want to ask next you, question. can you calculate the chances? You said they're infinitesimal, but how do you know they're infinitesimal? Is there any way of calculating how big they are? You make an assumption about how the world works, and within that framework, which you believe from previous experiments, you do a calculation. And you calculate, and people have calculated the, the, the chances for those black hole, holes forming, and also calculated that even if you form the tiniest of black holes, again, according to those, those calculations, those are the types of black holes that evaporate in no time, and they will do absolutely nothing. Now, all of that may be wrong, but again, like I said, chances of me get being hit by something when I go out of here are way, way bigger than something happening with that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Candice Dwan. Um, my background is primarily in art, but a little bit in science, too. and. Um, I had the experience of being uh, required to take calculus in college and, and <laughs> coming really strictly Sounds out of like the arts and uh, feeling like I was drowning. And every now and then I would get up and break the surface and see the sky and think, it's so beautiful, and then go right back down and, and feel like I was drowning again. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I sort of got a glimmer of what uh, beauty could be when you um, uh, have this kind of discovery of, of clarity and, and uh, the, 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 pure, the purity of the beauty of it. And I have a son who's a mathematician who experiences this apparently all the time. Ed knows. <laughs> he lives in this world. Um, but uh, this discussion is so great. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the 60s and 70s when we had um, a, a confluence of art and science. Uh, there, there was a real excitement about that and and so it, it it makes me remember that how how art and science can kind of come together and have this uh, you know very sort of healthy um, uh, excitement 
um, and um, uh, I, I'm not so sure what came out of it, but there's uh, so much more in common um, between the creative process and this sort of mystical mathematical process. Um, I just read that you know Newton um, had a mystical experience when he d discovered gravity. And uh, depending on what you think the mystical experience is, it seems, you know, a very strong, um, good thought to me. Um, and looking around this room, everyone, you know, is here with our brains. We're, it's, it, we're not really talking about our brains very much. But what if, what if our brains are, are our premise? It's like our ground. You know, if you, if you learn to fly a plane, you actually, you know, it's a big surprise. You get to leave gravity. Um, you actually get to to go into a whole other space. So here we are with our brains, the way they are, male brains, female brains, you know, with our, our, our uh, different structures and predilections, and, and here we are sort of rising out of, out of our mud of our brains and getting to some n nice clear place <laughs> for a moment of convergence and everything. And so... I think about how beautiful that is and how much it means to me. Um, and I wonder if it means uh, different things to uh, younger people these days, if, um, if our sense of beauty has actually evolved. And I think it's possible that it has, which is not to negate any previous sense of beauty. But what if beauty is, um, you know, my son uh, is very involved in randomness. Um, he's involved in where structure and chaos meet. And I think that he really feels this is beautiful. And uh, so this is another kind of area, I think, being a layperson myself here, uh, I think it's another area. It's kind of an evolution. And um, some people find the lack of order to be beautiful and uh, harmony and order. Okay. We have, uh, how many more questions do we have? Um, two more? Should we have two more? There's time for two more? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's have two more questions. It's about 20 to 5. One, 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 the Actually, uh, we cannot. I'm going to have. I have a train to catch. Okay. I have a train to catch. Uh, very short, because we're we'll running out of tape. Um, I'm, I'm here as an educator uh, who teaches math or tries to, aspires to. Um, and I wondered, you know, a lot of us, even if we are not educated well in math, we respond to beauty. How, as educators, we can make the association with beauty in a quicker, more efficient manner so that more students and more people would respond to beauty as much as they respond to math. Thank you. Well, why don't we have the other questions and you answer okay. both? Okay. Uh, is that the way along? Okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jeffrey. I'm a, a high school science teacher. And my question has to do with my experience in meditation. I, I find that um, I ex you can experience anything the moment as beautiful depending on if you are interpreting what you think on the other thing or if you just experience it directly as it is without processing that you know what that is. If you're, if you're with an unknown mind, it feels like everything's more beautiful. And I wondered if when you solve, come up with an elegant solution and you call it beautiful, is it beautiful because you figured out something of how the world works or is it more to do with that what you thought the universe was you realize it isn't, and it becomes more of a mystery. Is that where the beauty comes from? Uh, we have one more question, then you can take all three questions, and then we start. Come on, ask me. <laughs> Thanks. It's really wonderful. Hi, okay. Hi David. Um, done nothing. This is probably irrelevant, but I was wondering what, about the relationship between certain geometrical figures and their experience by people as being beautiful. Um, I had a, a playwriting teacher several years ago, and um, he would tell me that everything or everything in narrative takes place in, um, in uh, uh, structures of fives, uh, uh, like plays, screenplays, um, opera, symphonies, 
um, marriages, uh, births, um, uh, what is it, bullfighting. Basically, everything can be mapped into like a geometrical figure that basically looks like um, a roller coaster um, with the high end on the right. So I was just wondering if there was any correlation between uh, between the math and the beauty in that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you want to take a crack at it, Elisa? I want to say something quickly because I have to leave. Yeah. So, uh, in particular about the issue of uh, how do you uh, inspire the younger generation? That's a very big question. I wish it didn't come at the very last moment. Uh, but uh, let me say that I, I think it's the type of discussions that you actually heard here uh, that do the trick. Namely, I, I think that part of the problem is that uh, some of the cu curricula that are being taught in schools uh, involve uh, too much uh, technical exercising and so on, and they don't present neither math nor the sciences even as a part of culture. I mean, we should somehow convey to our students the fact that just as anybody uh, who finishes high school, let's say, uh, needs at least once to read a Shakespeare play, they also need to know what Newton's laws are. Um, and, and they need to see this bigger picture where science is a part of the human endeavor to understand the universe. Uh, and I think that this uh, can be conveyed via, you know, even more students attending these types of fora or, uh, you know, reading those more interdisciplinary type things, you know, and so on. And not just, you know, if you solve 20 more trigonometric problems, that's really not going to do it. Uh, I mean, the ones who will need that trigonometry will probably do enough exercises to, to use it. But it's the other people that, you know, we, we want both people, uh, young people to go into math and sciences, and even if they don't go into math and sciences, to be part of the people who are somewhat attentive to math and sciences. Uh, this is what, what we want to happen. Uh, uh, before I you, more, you, you want to say something about, uh, uh, I think it's in, in relationship to what you just said, I think that, the, the, that uh, Ed wanted to say a little something about the, the funding of these particular. Uh, well, it's because we got some funding from Templeton Foundation that made this roundtable possible. And we're very grateful about the But we have to still to. Barry, you want to you wanna answer? OK, well, let me, let me, let me just add questions? one one sentence to I agree with what Mario says uh, completely. But one, one thing is uh, to convey the beauty of mathematics to your students, you can't fake it. That is to say, you have to appreciate it. And to appreciate it, uh, if you do it, if you really appreciate it, you will convey it. And the other two questions? Then you any comments on the other two questions? I think, yeah. Are you yeah. done? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.